Trash, part three, chapter four. I had expected cells, but all I saw was cages. They were on my left and right, and they were the type of cages you might put lions and tigers in, in an old fashioned zoo. They were just high enough for a short man to stand up in, and they were about four meters long, maybe two meters deep. I looked up and saw that these cages were stacked three high with ladders up the sides. They continued in long rows, and I could see that there were alleyways between them. It was so terribly hot. As we passed the alleyways, I saw that they led you deep into more cages. It was like a warehouse, but every cage held people. As I walked among them, I was being stared at from left and right and from above. Also, because many people were lying down or sitting, I was being stared at from below. The noise was impossible. Everyone seemed to be shouting. Gardo put his hand in mine again, and it steadied me. Hello, ma'am, was being shouted again and again. Cheerful cries, friendly cries, and so much laughter. There were hands stretching out between the bars, and there were solemn faces as well as the laughing faces. Can you spare something, ma'am? Ma'am, ma'am, how are you? How are you? I looked to the right and stopped dead. I was looking at a boy who could not have been more than eight years old, wearing only shorts. He was smiling at me. In his lap sat a younger boy, sleeping. I think I said no and just looked at him, unable to move, stuck for a moment. Gardo eased me forward gently, but the eight-year-old started calling eagerly, and he stood up and came to the front of the cage so that he was holding the bars with both hands. Hello, ma'am, he said. Hello, ma'am. 20 pesos, ma'am. I turned around in a full circle. I was in the center of the place by now, and to turn was to lose yourself, because all the cages were identical. And though there were big signs with numbers, they meant nothing to me. I had no sense of direction anymore. All I could see was faces and hands waving, man, then child, young man, then older man, then child again, thin bodies glistening with sweat, almost everyone in shorts only, and a smell of old food, sweat, and urine. It's okay, said Gardo keeping his hand over mine. The guard who was escorting us had not noticed that we'd stopped. Now he did and waited. I was being asked questions. Where are you going? Where are you going, sister? What's your name? What country? American? American? Hi there. I love you. I love you, Joe. The guard came back. Gardo had my hand and my arm and was trying to get me moving. It was oven hot and the smell was getting worse. I knew that if I didn't move, I would fall, and I had a water bottle with me, thank goodness, and I drank deep and long, and there were people cheering. People were shouting out for water. I lost my balance and staggered against the bars. Gardo was there, but he couldn't hold me. I felt hands on my arm and my hair and voices whispering close. Help me, ma'am. Nobody here, ma'am. Nobody coming, ma'am. There was a young boy with dyed hair lying back in the arms of an older man. There was a child in a pair of torn pants curled up on a piece of newspaper. They were living in a furnace. Gardo disentangled the hands. They were stroking me. Ancient, anxious eyes, still so well-mannered, even in despair. To keep your manners? I could feel tears, useless tears, rising in my stupid eyes. I managed to walk on. It was like going uphill. I managed to take one step, then another, as if I was on stepping stones. I continued up the corridor. I looked ahead at the guard's blue shirted back and followed him, and we came to a metal door and went through it. When it shut behind me, I leaned against the wall and closed my eyes and cried. There was a staircase, and when I had recovered, I went up it. The noise and the smell gradually faded from me. The guard said, he's in the hospital now, he said something to a second guard, and another door was unlocked for us. We moved out of the bright light, and I was aware of a breeze from a wall fan. My eyes took time to adjust because the light was dim. I was led along a narrow corridor. I think there was a wheelchair. Then I was taken to the right into an empty room, and there was a table and several folding chairs. I sat in one and put my head low down because I still felt that I might pass out. I think Gardo disappeared for a moment. I think I was left alone. 
I drank more water, and after some time, I felt better. Gardo reappeared and sat next to me. I said, there were children in there. Gardo just looked at me. What have they done? He shrugged. They're poor. They do many things. But you can't lock up people like that. What have they done? Gardo said nothing. They steal, he said. After some time, maybe fighting. He smiled, his thin smile, as if to encourage me. They get some food. It's not so bad. We waited for, I don't know, time had changed. Maybe not long. And then we heard voices and two guards arrived. They were helping a very old man towards us. They had to be slow and patient with him because he could not walk very well. He was wearing dark, loose-fitting trousers and a white shirt buttoned at the neck. The guards supported him, but I saw that he had a stick as well, and he made his way painfully along the passage. He was staring at me, and I was struck by his burning white eyes, short-sighted but hungry, peering as if he had been waiting for me.